Hey everyone, welcome to another edition of Science Friday's live stream. My name is Diana. I am the experiences manager for Science Friday, which means I get to create cool events and all other kinds of gatherings for you all to get excited about science together. Um, if you don't know about Science Friday, we are your one-stop shop for all things science news. We um, are, the thing you might know us for is for our weekly radio program, which you can find on your local radio station every Friday from 2 to 4 p.m. But we also have all other kinds of stuff like educational resources, videos, um, what else do we have? We've got events like these, we've got digital articles. Um, if you can Go to our website, sciencefire.com. That is the place where you can find everything that we have to offer. But today we are here to celebrate the joy of insect pinning. And it's not just me. We've got some really great experts here today. We're going to hear from two insect pinning experts about why they collect insects, how insects help make uh, their way to personal university and museum collections, where you can pick up supplies, and they're going to show off some of their favorite specimens today. So insect pinning, when practiced responsibly and ethically, can help us better understand and feel a connection to the biodiversity of the environment. So today, we're going to explore the role of bug collections in science and conservation. And not just all of that, but our experts are each going to do a demonstration showing us how you can start your own insect collecting as well. So uh, a few people in the chat, by the way, are letting us know where they are from. So we'd love to see where everyone is from today. So we've got people from Kingston, Jamaica, um, let's see, Bend, Oregon, Syracuse, New York, New York City, Richmond, California. So no matter where you're joining us from, thank you so much for being here and keep letting us know in the chat. In addition, if you have questions for our experts, you can put them in the chat at any time and we'll get to as many as we possibly can throughout the entire program. We're going to be here for about an hour together today, so we'll try to get to your questions uh, as quickly and as many of them as we can. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome on our experts for today. So um, Ainsley Sego is the Curator of Invertebrate Zoology at the Carnegie Museum of Natural History in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Hey Ainsley, how's it going? Hello, good morning, Diana. It's going all right. We're having our presumably annual April snows over here. And mm -hmm. the weather outside mm -hmm. is grateful, but these bugs are so delightful. They so, really are, um, yeah. Really and a lovely shirt you are wearing today. We're all on theme, I think. <laughs> and we've got uh, one more expert that's joining us here today. Brittany Hahn is an environmental biology student at SUNY College of Environmental Science and Forestry in Syracuse, New York. Welcome, Brittany. Hi, guys. Thanks for having me. I'm yeah. also wearing stag beetle earrings, but unfortunately, my headphones are covering them. So, All right. We got Lou Cannon synergy. Awesome. Heck yeah. <laughs> I love it. Um, and yes, we've got a quick question from Susan asking if this uh, will be accessible after live stream. Yeah, you can come to the same link here. The full recording of the event will be available from here until the end of time. So you can rewatch this as many times as you'd like to learn more about uh, insect pinning. So um, let's start where we always do at the very beginning. Um, why? Why do we do these things? Ainsley, can you talk a little bit about why museums collect insects and, and what you do at the Carnegie Museum of Natural History. Well, I'm the curator of invertebrate zoology, which is honestly a bad name. It should just be entomology, but we also have crustaceans and it wouldn't be fair to exclude them. So mm -hmm. um, we also have a whole additional department of malacology, which is the home of Tim Pierce, our TikTok famous snail joke guy, which is also an invertebrate, but we don't have to acknowledge them. Um, so nice. I'm a study bugs because um, I always like nature. And I wanted to describe new species. And it turns out there's nowhere that's better to do that than working on bugs, especially things like beetles and wasps. There's more new species out there that could ever be described in my lifetime. And it's yeah. sometimes it's daunting. And um, most of the time, it's just really exciting. And there's lots of amazing stuff. It turns out that they can do, bugs do almost everything and anything. Um, so I also studied the field of biomechanics, which is how bugs do amazing feats of physical and photonic and chemical engineering. Um, and yeah, it's just, it's a really, really interesting field and you will literally never, ever, ever, ever run out of quasi research questions or things to do. Um, so that's me. I'm actually not a person who collects bugs for fun for a personal collection. A lot of people do. Um, I work in an insect collection right now. I'm literally surrounded by about 16 million specimens of pinned insects, um, many of which remain 
incompletely curated. <laughs> so I don't need to bring this problem home with me. Yeah. So there's absolutely nothing wrong with it. And a lot of the people who do the best work in insect taxonomy um, are actually people who do it as a side project, as a hobby. You might be a male carrier or a dentist or, a, you know, a teacher. And this can also, you know, studying insects and discovering new species can also be a fun thing, a passion project that you do on the side. And we welcome those people and we love to learn from them and also make sure that their specimens, if they describe a new species, get appropriately deposited somewhere that they will be kept intact forever. That's the job. Yeah. Keep those specimens in good shape forever and provide them for research. Does that happen so, often where people collect on their own and then their collections are added to museum collections? All the time. Um, we get stuff donated to us. Um, it's kind of unusual working in the museum here. Other other departments in the museum, like vertebrate paleontology, doesn't get a lot of, you know, oh, we got another 100,000 T-Rex heads donated <laughs> from one collector this year. But that happens to us almost every year. And we love it. We get some amazing stuff that way. Um, and if you describe a new species, it is absolutely essential. In fact, it's in the rule that you need to, or you should deposit a holotype that is the master example of that specimen in a museum where other people can look at it. And there's only a few a few case, edge cases where people haven't done that. And it makes it really hard to know if you've collected a new species in that same group. If I say, I've discovered, you know, a new species of moth, but you can't see it, <laughs> then it's really hard for somebody else to confirm whether they found that same species. And so we also function as a lending library. So every single mm. specimen is not just, it's not just the specimen itself, but it's also the data around mm -hmm. that specimen. And that's absolutely essential. It's so important. And so once you have the specimens and you have the data, especially if the data is digitized, um, you can do all of these amazing analyses looking at environmental change and how that affects and interacts with insect phenotypes or insect DNA through time only if you have the specimens and the data. If mm -hmm. you have a specimen with no data, that's just a dead bug and it <laughs> might as well be a decoration in your house. Go ahead, sure. Um, but the, the stuff we deal with here is insects that are intended to be used as individual units of data in scientific research. That's great. Yeah, that's so true. Also coming from more of a university perspective, we have a lot of entomology classes that require us to um, submit collections at the end of the term. And so um, one way that we get people to donate to our own collections is that professors will often offer you extra credit if you donate some of your cool specimens. But yeah, again, they also all have to have that associated with them. And um, even though we're college students, students who are studying this kind of thing, like if you have a personal collection that you're hoping to also um, one day donate to an institution or a museum or a university or otherwise, um, you might think like, ah, I just collected this on my own. I'm not even like a scientist or a college student. Like what's gonna happen to that? Like, it's still so important that you associate data with that because you collected that in the wild somewhere. And if you're donating it to a museum, they need that information. Like it will be useful, even if it's just you. Like, yeah, we're all just ourselves, like honestly. So it's important yeah. to do that. Brittany, how did you get into insect pinning? Um, that's a funny question. I actually was not um, hugely into insects until I think, um, in the middle of my uh, freshman year of college, I um, one day was like, I one day discovered that we were holding an entomology class at our school. And I was like, what do you mean you have an entire course dedicated to insects? So I signed up for it and I um, uh, heard that one of the course requirements was you had to submit an insect collection where you have to pin like 40 specimens, which at the time to me was like a bonkers amount. And I was like, what do you mean pinning insects? So I looked up so many YouTube tutorials online. This was the semester before that my entomology course was supposed to start. And I got so into it that I like ate up these YouTube tutorials and like pinned my first insect literally months before the semester started. And I was just like, this is amazing. And I am really interested in museum collections as a whole because of all the, um, reasons that Dr. Siegel brought up because they are tangible records of like time long, long past before any of us were even alive or even thinking about these kinds of things. So it's like crazy that you can kind of hold that record in your hand. And the fact that mm -hmm. some of the things that I might be preparing will contribute to that record someday in the future for scientists like decades or maybe even hundreds of years into the future is something really cool that I would like to help a lot with, so. That's amazing, yeah. I. I feel like this is what I think about a lot when I'm speaking with scientists or just science interested people that you kind of have to have the long 
goal in in mind when you're doing sure. some of this work because you might not mm -hmm. see the end result or you might not see how what you're doing now is going to affect people in the future and science in the future. Um, Ainsley, do you have a similar sort of like path to getting interested in entomology and with insect pinning? Well, much like Brittany, I uh, I was looking at the course catalog at Cornell University. This is 1,000 years ago when the course catalog was a big uh, sheet, a big book of newsprint with all the classes listed on it on paper. And it said entomology requirements, insect collection. And I said, instead of writing a paper, I could make an insect collection. Instead of taking an exam, I could go run around in the woods and grab bugs. Okay. And for me, I'm coming from someone who, like, I, I don't tell anyone, but I flirted with ornithology. I was into all kinds of nature. Scandalous. And I actually <laughs> didn't want to bugs because I don't want to kill things. I love things. I don't want to kill them. And I think we, we might touch on this later, but you don't really have to. Like, you can if you would like to. And for entomology courses, you usually need to. But, like, your, entom your entomology specimens can also be things that you found. Hey, I see some Cornellians in the audience. Hi, guys. Um, but, um, we're, uh, you really don't have to um, kill things if you don't want to. You can find plenty of dead insects in, in and around your house and your dorm and your basement. Um, we, had a, we almost had a riot in my, one of my entomology courses when someone said, there's silverfish in the basement of such and such of a hall. And everybody who was who didn't have enough orders in their insect collection said, oh my god, silverfish, I'll trade you two stag beetles for a silverfish. I've got a zygotoma. So it was a, it was a scene of chaos. But um, it's, a, it's really helpful to make an insect collection though, because you learn how much work actually goes into turning a dead bug into an irretrievable or an irreplaceable scientific specimen. Mm -hmm. And it also gives you a chance to identify every single thing that you collect. And again, back in my day, we didn't have bug guide or eye naturalist or a phone app that takes a picture of a bug and tells you what it probably is. And we had to, we were keying things out in one of the good old fashioned uh, entomology textbooks, like Gabor, Triple Horn, and DeLong. We were, you know, looking at our little field guides and saying, oh, I think I've got this. And uh, it was a real, it's, it's really an immersion approach to identifying things. And um, Brittany can probably talk about this as well, but in terms of using scientific keys, uh, some, there's, there's an old saying that scientific keys are created by people who don't need them for people who can't use them. <laughs> that's like kind I, of that's when I say a key, I'm not talking about, right, like an actual locking key. Okay. Yeah. Talking about, oh, let's see, how about healthy It's my favorite part of the event where everyone reaches off camera and then comes up with something <laughs> amazing. This is, is Ameri this is one volume of American Beatles. This is, is quite a book. Nice. The first of my I'm American Beatles on Twitter because when Twitter was new, I was thinking, I'll pick a username. And I looked up above my desk in grad school and it said American Beatles. And I was like, okay, sure. Go on. <laughs> but, um, this is a scientific key to some of the different genera. This does not go to species. This only goes to genus of genera of ladybugs in the United States of America. And it's things like distal maxillary palpamere broadly secureiform with sides strongly divergent apically. I don't expect sure. anybody <laughs> who's just getting started to parse this and read it. And we do have illustrations. Look at, look at all the different antennae that you can mm. have and mandibles and stuff. But this is what we use to identify bugs. And so all of the techniques that Brittany and I talked about today are going to be designed to prepare insects in such a way that you can actually identify them. That's why we don't just take a dead bug and staple it to a, an index card and say, all right, I'm done. <laughs> uh, you have to prepare them in certain ways so that you can see all the features. Um, I'm going to say diagnostic characters because that's what mm -hmm. we call them. But that's yeah. what, what you've got to look at to make it through one of those keys without jumping out a window. Yeah, that For makes sure. sense. Yeah, we've got a I'm, great question from the chat. Um, Nancy's got a question. How do you keep your collections from getting, well, eaten by other small bugs as it ages? That is a great question. Um, what suggestions do you have for Nancy and other budding uh, entomologists? Um, I would say for your own personal collection, definitely try to find a tightly sealed box. Um, honestly, I've gone to um, garage sales and gotten like really large wooden jewelry boxes with a clear... Um, front casing for like relatively cheap, like just like $3 is the thing that I'm using for my own personal collection right now. Um, what my entomology professors have recommended 
for personal collections is literally just to put in mothballs to um, deter pests, um, most of which are probably going to be like these things called dermestid or carpet beetles because they'll just eat everything up. Um, additionally, what I just recently discovered is that in some of our um, teaching collection and actual research collection specimen boxes is that there's these like red strips of um, tape that are coated with certain kinds of like um, pest deterrent chemicals. So mm. those are also certainly an option, but mothballs are pretty like cost effective um, the box itself should be like relatively well sealed. So yeah, that is about what I have for personal collections, but yeah. Mm -hmm. Ainsley, what do uh, museums and, and uh, other sorts of organizations do to, to protect the- Historically? Uh, yeah. Historically, we also use mothballs or we get them in just the raw chemical form of mm -hmm. naphthalin. Um, this museum used to order paradichlorobenzene in like oil drum type barrels like this high. Um, and there was a move that was made some decades ago uh, before my time here to transition completely from using stinky chemicals that re that repel, but are usually never 100% successful, um, repel those domestic pest insects and things like silverfish as well, um, to, in our case, um, no chemicals at all. We just have two gigantic walk-in freezers. So um, if you need to hide a body, you can talk to us. We often do disinfest stuff for um, other departments in the museum. If you're bringing in a big woolen rug from the anthropology collection, that's gonna need to get frozen so you're not accidentally bringing in um, clothes moths or other wool eating insects along with it. Yeah, big and problem. And so we freeze everything. And this is a great way for people who are concerned about preserving insects to also make sure that if you acquire a new insect that you're going to, a new dead in an insect, especially something you found dead and you're gonna put it in your collection, put it in the freezer at least two days. Um, maybe up to a week um, because you want any larvae of little dermestid beetles or anything else that's in there to be dead. That's mm -hmm. also a good way to kill insects if you are collecting and you can't bring yourself to use one of the other um, more instantaneous killing methods like making a kill jar um, or there's a you can with butterflies you can pinch the thorax. Um, for me, I usually collect directly into ethanol because I want to preserve the DNA, but you can also just put things in the freezer and they will basically, they're ectothermic, so they will basically slow down and they will die. Um, and I just want to say, can I address a couple of questions in the chat? Um, Absolutely. And yeah, question from Flatbush Gardener. I think I think you already follow me on Twitter, so don't worry about it. And a question from Jimmy Vallarta. Um, how do the specimens not fall apart over time? Mm. And I'd like to very quickly say that um, as somebody who specializes in beetle technology, beetles are very robust and powerful. Um, <laughs> they are... The, they they have a thicker cuticle than other insects. That's just the exoskeleton. And the stuff that their exoskeleton is made of, and all these insect exoskeletons are made of, is called um, chitin. And chitin is structurally, it's a polysaccharide, but it basically acts like the keratin in your fingernails or in your hair. And it um, it's a lot like Kevlar. It's many, many, many overlapping layers of cross-linked sort of fibrous material. And the outside of it is usually coated with a bit of a form of wax to help present, prevent moisture loss. And they will keep forever in that mm -hmm. form. We found beetles from Charles Darwin's insect collection. There are specimens that were collected by Linnaeus. Um, there's you know stuff from the 18th century that is still there for you to see in museums in Europe and North America. So they just, people see some of this really, you know, like are really shock, shockingly iridescent things and say, did you paint that? Why is it so shiny and colorful? Or, no, we didn't. That's just bugs being bugs. So yeah. um, they don't fall apart over time unless you let dermestid beetles eat them. That's yeah. true. And unfortunately, um, another thing, point on that question is that not all insects are created equal. Not everyone has such a nice and robust um, elytra like beetles do. Um, a lot of times you'll have other insects that are like somewhat more fragile. Something off the top of my head that I think of a lot are the odonates. So your damselflies mm. and dragonflies, especially damselflies, you know, like the really thin cousins of, of dragonflies, their abdomens, that really long part are super delicate. They, they look like sticks as you can see. And oftentimes if you even like move the box wrong, it'll just like plop off and it's just like, oh. And then other times you have um, other similarly really delicate looking insects like um, crane flies or mosquito hawks. Those things people <laughs> might think are really large mosquitoes. They're, um, they're totally unrelated. They're in a different family of flies, but um, their legs are so, so, so long um, that they also have this thing called um, autotomy 
which is when um, if they are in, if they sense that they're in danger, they'll actually just um, willfully drop off their arm. Uh -huh. um, but that's really hard to deal with because we have kind of this like inside joke between all entomologists that it's impossible to properly pin crane flies because you're just inevitably going to have one or several of the legs fall off. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go so grab, some they, I'm gonna go grab some crane fly specimens to back yeah, this up. Yeah, please. Yeah. Like, I think I also have one. Uh, it might be a little hard to see. I'm honestly really scared to like um, to take it out of them. the box. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I'm gonna see if I can hold Ooh. the box kind of like this. But very okay, cool. Box. So that really big like looking mosquito thing. Mm -hmm. This is actually one of the better ones possibly because um, it uh, has. Oh well, it only has four legs. But they look symmetrical, so that's nice at least. Yeah, <laughs> that's pretty cool. Yeah, they're so they're so small. It must be pretty difficult to pin something like that. Yeah, for sure. The thorax is super con constricted on that, which is the place where you usually want to um, insert the pin on yeah. those insects. But yeah, <laughs> that one looks nice and symmetrical. But yeah, I was missing two of its legs. So <laughs> yeah, so here's here's insects when you want to pin on hard mode. This hmm. is a crane fly. This is uh, this is leptotarsus, which means long legs, which sure, but they're all kind of shaped like this. And um, the Carnegie Museum actually has one of the world's best crane fly collections because we had a curator here named um, Chen Young who studied crane flies. And what he did is he would pin them sideways. So I'm going to grab another specimen from his selection of mounts here. And they are absolutely remarkable. So <laughs> what he would do is he would fold them up in little paper envelopes, which is a technique that's often used for temporarily pinning um, or temporarily preserving wow. moths and butterflies. And he would fold them up sideways, let them dry like that, and then point mount them. That is to say, glue them to a little triangle of paper. And when you do this, you end up with a crane fly that has all six legs intact. I don't know if you can see this. I'm struggling not to breathe on this specimen because yeah. that's what causes all of their body parts to fly off simultaneously. <laughs> <Felt that. laughs> um, but crane flies are a real challenge when it comes to insect preparation. So that's only for advanced users and people who really have something to prove. Yeah, that's yeah. super fair. <laughs> it does so look I like, said, like pinning on X Games mode. And I totally agree with that. Like the strats that people have to come up with to like yeah. pin certain things properly. Like sometimes, when I like to challenge myself, I tried to pin like micro moths and it's like the amount of like the amount of research I had to do on like different ways to pin them is just like, oh my God. <laughs> so yeah. much. Yeah, I mean, is intense. It well, was. <laughs> you two are gonna show us in just a few minutes what it's like to actually pin. So I'm really excited about that. But I do wanna answer one of the questions. Uh, we started talking a little bit about this at the very beginning of the event, but I wanna address Krista's question about how do you collect responsibly and ethically? They love the idea of collecting and preserving, but extinguishing an insect's life. What, what, what do you, what sort of advice do you have for people who are interested in this hobby or perhaps going, you know, into this as a career, but even if they're not, if they want to do this as a hobby, as something that they enjoy, um, what advice do you have for people as they're, they're thinking about this? Brittany, do you want to go first? Uh, yeah, sure. So there's um, several things that I've been told by my professors, like even in like the guidelines of our insect collection um, syllabi is that kind of, so first of all, there is like an insane amount of insects in the world. I think on the number of like trillions of insects, in fact. So, um, killing one is not going to be damaging any populations in the wild. Um, additionally, um, insects usually also only live, um, especially in their adult forms, for really short periods of time. Sometimes it's within the warm season. Sometimes it's even on the matter of like hours or days if you're looking at something like a mayfly. So um, it's not quite something that uh, we're necessarily too concerned about, but I totally understand where you're coming from. Like in extinguishing the life of any organism is definitely kind of hard to do. I also sort of feel that another thing that people can do is also, um, like I think we mentioned earlier, you can also look for insects that have already died like around your house or in public places. I've definitely snagged wasps from the uh, library of my, from the window of my public library before, um, but they're going to be really dry. So what you want to do is create like um, a relaxing chamber. I'm sure Dr. Sego has a more professional version of that, but um, Diana, if you could pull up that picture that I have of my makeshift um, relaxing chamber that I made at home. You can, anyone can do this at home. It's literally, you just take Tupperware, um, something to elevate the insect in and pour in hot water and wait for a few days to a week. My setup is a broken Tupperware container with an overturned soju glass. So 
yeah, you could. That's <laughs> the extent that you can go to. It's it's just and as so, easy as that. And so in this home version, the insect is actually on top of the of the ceramic glass you have in there. Yeah, exactly. And mm -hmm. then you that just wait right for a few days, and hopefully this it'll get it to hydrate and relax a little before you can pin it. Very this cool. might be another area. I'm not here to say that beetles are objectively better than every other kind of insect, but, <laughs> but with beetles, you can just soak them in hot water. Mm -hmm. Just give them a bath. They'll relax immediately. Can't mm -hmm. do that with almost anything else, but boy, can you do it with beetles. So it's great. Yeah. Um, in terms of ethical, if you want to learn how to prepare insects, another approach is to volunteer at your local natural history museum, because speaking only for us, we have millions and millions and millions of bugs that need to be sorted out and put away and things that need to be labeled, things that need to be identified, things that need to be curated, things that I know where this goes, but I literally don't have the time in my day to go put it where it goes. We have specimens um, that were donated to us. We talked about receiving donations from people who do this as a hobby or just for funsies. And they give us tens of thousands of specimens and we pull out all the really like really valuable, rare, cool stuff, usually right away, sometimes a few years later. And then the rest of it kind of sits for a while. And um, I am so grateful for the volunteers that we have here at the Carnegie who help us pull that stuff out, get it pinned, get it labeled, get it sorted, get it ID'd and put it away. And so, um, you know, they, they don't even have to know what it is to identify it, but, um, you know, to at least get it into a state that we can identify it. So we call this, we don't call it bug pinning here, we call it preparation because you're preparing the specimen for identification and curation. Mm -hmm. That's great. Um, I will show, can I show something off that I found with one of my volunteers? Um, Love a show and tell. He's an awesome volunteer at Phoenix, who is a high school student who comes and works with us about one day a week. And what Phoenix and I found, we were going through a donation from about 15 years ago. And we found these structures that looked like um, a Ziploc bag of cigars. We're like, oh, are there cigars Interesting. in this uh, specimen donation? And it turns out that they are actually giant millipedes. So I don't know if I can show this giant millipede off, but it's a very large tropical millipede. Wow. And it's been rolled up in a piece of paper that is a catalog from Smith, Stana Street and Company Limited of sodium hydnocarpate and uh, carbostilamide and livergen and other um, snake oil medicines that you could order. And would the this be a method you would suggest for budding uh, insect collectors? Not to wrap up your uh, millipede like a cigar, but yeah. to volunteer with an insect collection? Absolutely. And we can always use volunteers. Yeah, all you'll you find gems is, like that. All you need is a steady hand. That's awesome. Um, well, I want to keep asking questions, but I also really want to show the audience what it's like to pin insects. So if um, we wouldn't mind sort of transitioning to that, that would be great. So Ainsley, you're just going to, you're just going to um, tilt down whenever you're ready. I'm going to tilt the camera down. Go yeah. for it. And Brittany's going to yeah. um, transition to a um, another camera. Ainsley, while um, they're doing that, could you tell us, what are we looking at here? What, what have we got? All right. Well, first of all, um, Brittany will show us this too, but uh, what we both have in front of us is a pinning board. So when you pin insects, you want to pin into something that is relatively soft, but not so squi but not totally squishy. And styrofoam is actually perfect for this. We also have, I'm sorry, I don't have one in front of me right now. We also have pinning blocks that are, we used to make um, pinning blocks by taking a phone book again, another relic of the before times, curling it into a really tight spiral, like a, like, like a, you know, curled up, what, what do you, what do you call it? It was like a Swiss roll, mm, mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. wrapping it all up in tape and then cutting it into pieces with a bandsaw. And the edge of a phone book slice cut like that is also an absolutely perfect pinning substrate. What I've done is I've taken my piece of styrofoam that came in a box with something else. And I've used pins to attach a um, paper towel on top of it, because when you are pinning fresh insects or insects that have been rehydrated, they're gonna be juicy and you want something to absorb the bug juices. In this case, I've got some um, bycatch specimens. We just had, we have many jars like this of specimens that were not part of the project, but happened to come into the traps that we were using and we don't want them to go to waste, but we can't use them until they've been prepared. So I'm gonna prepare some of those today. Amazing. And Brittany, tell us a little bit about your setup before you uh, start pinning with us. 
Right. So I also have um, a pinning board. Um, there's more professional ones that you can buy online that are made of, I believe, pine wood so that the pins like go through them easily. But uh, the funny story about this one is that um, I went to, I think, Home Depot to like buy a bird feeder. And then I happened to see this discarded piece of um, styrofoam. And the entomologist within me was like, oh, my God, I need to have this. And thankfully, it was literally just like a piece of trash to them. So I just took it for free. Like, how could you discard something like this for free? It's like excellent, <laughs> excellent material. So what I also um, did additionally was that I took a screwdriver and I um, heated it in the stove and um, until it was hot enough to like melt the styrofoam. And then I carved these grooves into it. Um, going from like really thin up here for things like microleps down to um, this groove at the bottom, which is reserved for something as big as like a Saturnid. But um, if you're trying to pin something like a beetle or any other insect whose wings do not necessarily need to be spread, you can just take a flat piece of styrofoam and do it there. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Ainsley, can you tell us a little bit more about what you're doing right now? Um, well, right now I have a Dobson fly that I pinned because I needed to do something with my hands mm -hmm. uh, while we were uh, getting ready for this. Um, and this is another old specimen. This is actually from someone's student insect collection hmm. that they turned in with no data. Mm, and so what this specimen is going to become is either it's either going to be decoration it will be used in an exhibition out in the hallway where we don't try to put our research grade specimens or it will be used in um, teaching so mm -hmm. um i have a lot of plans and schemes afoot to try to weasel my way into teaching even though i'm technically a curatorial uh staff member. Mm -hmm. I love teaching entomology. It's my favorite thing. And having a teaching collection, like like uh, Brittany mentioned, is so valuable because that means you can then say, here are the common insects around here. Mm -hmm. Here is mm -hmm. what they are. Um, if there's people in the chat who haven't heard of a Dobson fly, I can say, this is a Dobson fly. This is a female Dobson fly. Their, their larvae are called Helgramites and are one of the most horrifying things that you can find in freshwater <laughs> habitats in North America. And I love them. Um, no relation oh. to cold debtors, though. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, uh, Ainsley, you've said a few times, no, said some of these come to the collection with no information. What does it look right. like when they come with information? Like, what, what are you looking for in a, in a well, uh, informationed bug? Well, I can do that without tilting down, <laughs> but here's a great example. Again, this is from, um, Chen's, I'll give you one of Chen's specimens because they actually have all their legs. This is one that did not come from Dr. Young. And you can see this is a crane fly that was prepared. This is an important specimen. It was prepared by a professional entomologist. It has three legs. Mm -hmm. um, because again, crane flies are entomology on hard mode. Yeah. And um, these are by Dr. Young. And these are, this is a very good specimen. And here are the basic information you need. It's like doing journalism. You want to know where it came from, mm -hmm. when it was collected, who collected it. And then ideally you want to know what it is and how it was collected. So this was collected in West Virginia, Randolph County, Cheat District, 3.7 kilometers north northwest of Bowdoin, Stuart Knob. It was collected, um, and they get the lat long on there. This was done as part of a survey of the Monongahela region. It was collected by Lisa Merrill at an ultraviolet light. This wow. also has a unique specimen number that says this is Carnegie Museum specimen number, you know, 2,875. Mm -hmm. um, and then it was it was prepared and identified by Dr. Young. So it says this is Leptotarsus subgenus longurio uh, and the species is Testaceus. The name of the person who described that species was low and it was identified by Dr. Chen Young. Very so cool. all of that information all of that information is right here on this little dead bug and tiny pieces of paper. And they're all the, all of these components are worthless on their own. It's a piece of paper. It's a dead mm -hmm. bug. Who cares? Like, you know, you could peel one of these off the front of your car mm -hmm. uh, for driving through West Virginia and it wouldn't mean anything. But now that we have this, I could look at, you know, how isolated are, yep. <laughs> how isolated are the different populations of, uh, leptotarsis throughout Eastern North America. I can take D I could take DNA by removing one of these legs mm -hmm. and extracting DNA from it and then analyze it along with the DNA from a bunch of other specimens. Mm -hmm. um, I could look at what, what season do they emerge 
Mm -hmm. uh, are they coming out earlier or later um, in a certain time of year? Has their, has their habitat moved up or down in terms of elevation yeah. um, because of climate change? So that's the kind of data that we can get now that we have that specimen. The bare minimum, bare minimum is when and where. Yeah, exactly. We won't die if we don't know who collected it. Yeah, but it's good. It's good information. Yeah, that's great. Brittany, sure. um, yeah, can you tell us a little bit? So when you're collecting um, insects, yeah. what what do you can include all of that information? Most of it, what is what does your collection look like? Yeah, I also try to put as much information down as possible. Usually um, when I'm collecting in the field, I don't really have like a notebook with me because, oops, I think that's a little cumbersome. So what I usually do is I just like write things down on my phone in like a notes app about mm. what I collected. So um, if we take a quick look at some things I've basically written down, like um, I'll write that, oh, I found this tenthrodinid wasp on March 31st inside of um, a certain lab at our school. So yeah, Very if cool. it was... Um, Doing something more like sweep netting, maybe I also would have recorded like, oh, it was sweep netting instead of like having to just like find it by chance. Mm -hmm. Oh, also, can we address a good question by, I yeah. believe, Shell Johnson in chat? Are there certain types of pins that work best for the at-home pinner? That is a very good question because, yes, there is kind of like a standard-ish size. Um, hopefully that focuses. Yeah. That says number two. So um, pins kind of come in different sizes. I have bought additional um oops one and zero sizes so the bigger the the larger the number the larger the diameter of the pin most insects at least where i live in the northeastern united states are going to be like mostly around that big so a size two is usually what you would like to go with um if we're talking maybe something like the size of this tiny little green tenthrodinid wasp maybe something like a size zero or one would be better but honestly point mounting at that point might also be better too. Mm -hmm. yeah. But yeah, I would say in our collection, if you need a size zero pin, you don't need a pin, you need a point mount. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Yeah, we'll talk a little bit more about point mounts in just a minute as well. But um, another question, as you are pinning, I'm going to ask from the chat is from Cindy, who is wondering about your recommended sources for insect pinning supplies as one of the biggest uh, suppliers recently closed, BioQuip. So do you have other places that people might be able to find supplies? Another really good question. Um, BioQuip, yeah, God rest your soul. But um, <laughs> I don't really want to plug Amazon, but for um, a relatively um, not very costly sol solution would just be to, yes, buy your insect pins off Amazon. I think these came like relatively quickly for me. Other um, reputable sites that I've heard of but haven't um, ordered off myself are things like Carolina Scientific. Um, there's several other sites that will pop up if you Google search insect pins. Um, that have been trusted sites by, I think, probably like biology classrooms in both like high school, college level, like all across the country. So if you would not like to go to Amazon, those are also good sites. It's just the pins will be like slightly more expensive, maybe in like the, the tens of dollars. But mm -hmm, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, it looks like Ainsley, it looks like you're ready to, are, what are you preparing yeah. right now? And can you walk, just narrate what you're doing so that sure. our, our can see. Well, I'm nervously preparing another Dobson fly because I need something to do with my hands. Again, <laughs> the majority of the um, the insects that I personally work with as a taxonomist and systematist are little brown beetles. This is actually a whole arrangement of little brown beetles and a few extra wasps. These were all collected from sticky traps inside our museum because we were trying to monitor pests. And it turned out we have all of these things that aren't even museum pests at all wandering around inside here. It's probably because we're next to a big wooded area, mm. but I think they just kind of blow in from the woods, come in our 120 year old windows and you know, and don't really know what to do with themselves. Mm -hmm. But I most, most of my work is with little guys on points. I don't have to do a lot of pinning big things. And so because this is a special occasion, I'm really cutting loose and I'm pinning these Dobson flies. So this is a female Dobson fly. This is a male Dobson fly. These are old specimens um, that came to us without data, but I feel like they would be really neat to use in outreach situations, um, especially for, I think, people who are fishing enthusiasts probably enjoy learning about, um, you know, freshwater insects, because that's what you might be using your flies that are based on, or you might be trying to catch fish that feed on these. So with Dobson flies, I'm going to pin approximately through the first um, 
segment of what's called the pterothorax. So in all insects, you want to pin, generally speaking, if you're pinning it, you pin it through the pterothorax. Um, and what that just means is the part of thorax that the wings are attached to. Um, it's the same with beetles. I don't know if this is visible at all, but this is a beetle. And I've pinned it right where you'd put kind of a boutonniere through the mesothorax. That's the first segment that the wings are attached to. And the reason that we do that is because if you pinned it through the head, the back of the body would probably fall off. If you pinned it through the butt, the front of the body would probably fall off. If you pin it through the joint between two thoracic segments, you're also going to make it more likely to be subject to mechanical stresses and fall apart. Mm -hmm. um, but what I'm doing with this Dobson fly is I'm making a display specimen. When you're making a museum specimen, you want all the wings to be tucked up. You want the antennae to be folded back. You want the legs tucked in, the wings tucked back. Everything should be very, very compact. With some groups like our old enemies, the tipulids, you hmm. really can't make them very compact. Mm -hmm. And these are the nemesis of people like me because think how many of my little brown beetles I could fit in this tray if it wasn't full of five whole crane flies. Yeah, they take up a lot more room. They do. Um, there's an old joke among beetle people that we could probably could save so much space in our collection if we just cut half the wings off all the Lepidoptera. Yeah. That's <laughs> so cruel. But, I know. <laughs> what I'm also doing, though, is that as I'm spreading these wings out, um, this lets us see the wing veins. Mm. And you don't, need, you don't usually need those quite as much when you're trying to identify a Dobson fly because you look at it and you say, wow, look at that enormous Dobson fly. Mm -hmm. This one also has its claspers hanging out. These are part of the genitalia. And they are just hanging right out there. And usually with most insects, you have to um, dissect them to get mm -hmm. that. And so this basically shows us all of the important features that we need to be able to see to tell what species we have. So yeah. I'm, I'm putting pins in between the wing veins to help hold the wings out. This is similar to what we'll do for big moths and stuff as well. Um, and the goal is to get the whole thing to dry out. These have been hydrated in my relaxing chamber. And once they dry out again, they will stay in that pose indefinitely. So Brittany, you also have a very charismatic looking um, moth there. Can you tell us a little bit about what that is? And so someone has a question of actually, how do you keep the wings from breaking? So we just watched Ainsley sort of like delicately move the wings with a pin to try and put them into place. But you've got this moth here. Tell us a little bit about it. And if you were to pin it, what it would be right. like. So this is kind of um, an interesting case. And God, I really wish I could show you how to pin it. But I'll tell you the funny story about this. So um, where I live, it's been very cold recently, so I haven't unfortunately been able to get um, spreadable specimens myself. But um, I went to a professor of mine and he gave me this um, royal walnut moth, which is a um, relative of like other things like polyphemus moths or the famous luna moth. Um, the thing about this, this particular specimen was that it was collected, I believe it was frozen three years ago, so it's quite stiff. And um, this is also another makeshift relaxing chamber that he made. Usually you want to put this in the relaxing chamber for a few days at the very least to a week, especially for something as large as this. And you might've seen me trying to fiddle with the wings as Dr. Sego was pinning her wonderful Dobson flies, but it, they really are not budging because this was only in there for five hours, which you might think is a very long time. But nope. again, the specimen is so old. Um, it's been frozen for a really long time. So you really do need to give it like several days at the very least to let it relax properly. And um, some additional things kind of for pinning different insects. Um, I think someone had a question on like pinning techniques for different insects, right? So um, usually, or like what one might think is that, oh, everything should be in the center. Exactly. That is actually very untrue, especially for beetles. So um, you don't, um, well, especially, yeah, for beetles, their elytra or their shell often has um, lots of like really distinct patterns on them. I mean, this one isn't really the case, but a lot of times they do. And so in order to preserve any patterns that are at the center of those elytra, you actually want to pin it a little off to the right as hopefully I'll be able to demonstrate right now if my hands are not too mm. shaky. Yeah, and so it went through easily through the right. So you also kind of want to do that for various other insects, but, and so yeah, hopefully, is that the one of the things yeah. that you should, you should try to be aware of as well, very good, mm -hmm. is that 
their legs are on the underside of the body. And often you have to look at the, the legs, like how many socketed denticles are present on the protibia. If, for example, you're trying to identify little um, bark beetles. Mm. And so you don't want to knock all the legs off when you pin it. So that's another reason that we pin asymmetrically. And when we point mount, we also point mount asymmetrically. And I can get to point mounting in a second, but I'm just going to try to not screw up this moth too badly. Um, <laughs> I have a professional quality pinning board, but this is an unusual type of pinning block for Lepidoptera. Most people use what Brittany's got, which is styrofoam with a groove in the middle. Um, here at the Carnegie, we practice what I would describe as... Um, insect bondage. Wow. Um, we have these <laughs> sabari like uh, strings. This is, um, I believe this technique is what was used by William Holland, who founded our collection and was also one of the first directors of the Carnegie Museum. Mm. He was a um, double barreled, he was both a vertebrate paleontologist and a lepidopterist. And he wrote a book called The Butterfly Book, followed by its sequel, The Moth Book, which were sort of, you know, hit guides to doing this as a hobby back before people had video games and TV. Mm -hmm. And um, in his method, you pin the, uh, the specimen in the pinning block. You'll want it to go in at a little bit of an angle. It's really challenging because the pin needs to go straight down through the body, straight perpendicular to the body axis. But when you put it in the pinning block, you want the butterfly to be, or the moth's body to be tilted up a little bit. Mm. And this is because you want the wings to come out naturally. Mm. Um, insects that fly with all four wings at once have a series of little hairs or spines called jugae or hamulae that connect the front wing to the back wing to form a single continuous flight surface. So um, when you talk about, you know, how do insects fly, they almost never are operating all of their wings independently. The insects that do that are either, you know, very weak flyers or they have a, an unusual kind of flight musculature called direct flight muscles. Mm. So anyway, what I'm trying to do is drag these wings out to such a point that you can see the front and the back wing really clearly. And I also want the wings to be resting flat against the surface of this pinning block. And the normal way to do this is to take a little slip of paper like so and place it flat over the wing and then put in pins around the wing. Mm -hmm. Here I've used a pin to hook just under the front vein of the wing, the costal vein, to mm -hmm. pull the wing forward. And then once I've got the paper in place, I can pull that out. But today, because I'm feeling wild. I'm going to actually try holding this in place with the string in the original Holland method. And this may not work at all. I don't know. We're going to find out. Godspeed. <laughs> well, in addition to um, the Lepidoptera and the um, Coleoptera, which are the uh, butterflies, moths, and beetles, respectively, um, sometimes you might not have something with just like um, an exposed thorax necessarily or the shell of a beetle. So in this case, what I have here is a stink bug or a member of the true bugs, the hemiptera. A so in this bug. case, it yeah, sounds dangerous. <laughs> and yeah, it, it lives up to its name. It is a little, um, it's a little smelly right now, but that's because it, they kind of exude <laughs> that chemical when they die. Unfortunately, it's not bad. Don't worry. But um, yeah, it's not harmful. It's fine. <laughs> but um, yeah, so for um, insects like this, you might see. Oh, it's going to be really hard to see this. But for stink bugs, often they'll have this really big triangular thing structure here called a scutellum. And what mm. you want to do is pin um, the insect through kind of the right side of that scutellum, which I'll do right now. Hopefully you can see that. Uh... There's actually in every entomology book, there's whether it be a field, an older field guide or a textbook, there will be a little diagram that shows you with a dot where to put the pin on the type of bug that you have. Oh, that's that is great. Also true. Yeah, I should have those... dropped yeah, one of those in the shared documents for this pinning hour, but I did not because I did not think of it. That's okay. We can include it. We're going to send some emails afterwards, actually. So if anyone wants to um, sign up for our events newsletter, we're going to send a little message later on this week about some of the tips and tricks that our um, experts here have given us for insect pinning. So you can sign up for that email uh, in the chat. Um, Brittany, show us yeah. what you got. Yeah. So I have pinned the um, stink bug. Hopefully you can oh, see cool. that through yep. the right side of the scutellum. And you can also see that I have left enough room at the top of the um, pin for someone to easily hold this. So you don't want to make it like all the way up here 
And you also don't to... want to make it too far down because that's where the data label is eventually yeah. going to go. Yes. So that is about the right height where you want it. So like you can have enough room to comfortably pinch it like that. Mm -hmm. um, I think Dr. Siegel mentioned this earlier. There are also pinning blocks that you can um, professionally buy somewhere so that you can um, totally standardize the height at which you pin the insects. But yeah, yes. there has to still be enough room for the labels to go underneath. Mm -hmm. And um, for labels, if you want them to last a really long time, what we do in collections is that we buy um, archival standard paper and pens. Um, pa these are actually things you can just go out and buy at a craft store. This yep. was labeled um, archive safe. This was also labeled as archive safe. And the reason I know, okay, yeah, so the brand is, um, I'm holding it up like a makeup <laughs> guru in a YouTube tutorial, but this is a uh, Pigma Micron, which is really funny because when I was younger, I used to draw a lot and do line art. And this was the pen that I used. So I was very um, surprised to find out that museum professionals even use this brand. Yeah, but same. I, yeah, right. And I can attest to how effective it is because I have several specimens here that um, are preserved in ethanol. Oh, and wow. I used this pen and this brand of paper and it's like the writing is clear as day. Or maybe my handwriting's a little illegible, but <laughs> you can see that it's not smudged like whatsoever. And you That's can amazing. see the, the little log cabin guy. Little, That's uh, very cool. Great concentric, uh, Aww, I love those guys. Yes, um, they're so cute. Here's an example. This is an unusual example of a pinning block. Usually a pinning block looks like, looks like a little stair step structure that has like a, you know, one, two, and three different levels mm -hmm. to make sure all the labels are at a consistent level across all of your specimens. This one is very compact and someone has um, labeled the, there's, I think it says one, two, and three. And so there's three different levels of how deep the pin goes in. So it barely goes in at all to the, um, how can I do this? Level one. Huh level two and level three, the pin goes in the deepest. So this is another thing that you, it's just a little tool you use to make sure that you're putting on your labels at the same exact depth. And I can demonstrate that in a second. I also found the slice of phone book, pinning block that we love so much. Um, they're just, they're very compact and it's just, it's just a fantastic pinning That's surface. That's cool. Um, um, how did the, uh, the <laughs> wrapping of the <laughs> go. It looks pretty I good. I think it's okay. Here's an example. This is an example that someone else did many years ago and just left oh, our wow. drawing cupboard. Um, so in this case, again, they use paper. In my case, I've just kind of um, thrown it down because I have many of these to practice with. Yeah. Uh, my, my string isn't as cleanly wrapped. Um, I think that it broke a couple of times in the mm. wrapping process, but I'm gonna go ahead and give it a second try with one of my other backup moths. Amazing. Actually, let's take this moment to talk a little bit about um, point mounting. So you do Yay. point mounting when yes. there's, they're just too small to get a, a pin through. So um, tell us a little bit about what that process is like. Exactly. It can be too small to get a pin through or too risky to get a pin through in the mm. case, again, of those crane flies. So um, like I showed you, the crane flies are so delicate when you pin them, they often fall apart and having them with all of their legs just hanging out like that is just waiting for trouble to happen. Mm. And so um, in this case, these crane flies, each, every single one of them has been not pinned. It is on a little piece of paper and I'm gonna try moving the labels aside. So I don't know if we can see the little strip of paper uh, that yeah. is glued to that crane fly. You are literally just gluing the bug to a piece of paper. Very cool. Um, and we've got a video of you point mounting a very small yeah. beetle that I'm gonna I'm gonna play for us right. right now. Oh, Ainsley, if uh, you want to tell it, you'll have to unmute if you want to tell us a little bit about what's going on here. Thank you for reminding me to unmute. So on point mounting, I have a whole bunch of points already made up on pins. I'm gonna bend down the tip of the paper point with my forceps apply a single drop of insect adhesive to it. This is just shellac glue from BioQuip. Position the specimen and then just lightly touch the tip of that paper point with glue to the beetle and it'll pick it right up because it's super tacky glue. And I make sure it's positioned correctly. And there it is. When we look at this, I usually do this under the microscope. When you look at it through the scope, you can see a uh, beautiful beetle and dermestids are actually really pretty and threenus like that are actually gorgeous when you look at them close up under the microscope. This doesn't make them less of our enemy though. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's pretty cool. Um, 
Brittany, what else you got going on here? So um, you've got some beetles, but you've got something else I think I might oh. recognize on that board. Right, yeah. So this is also another case when um, if you feel bad about killing insects, I in fact know most people, there are some insects that pretty much anyone is willing to kill or just generally see dead or yeah, they're just going to be very common in your own household. But I have here is an American cockroach, which we um, found um, at my school. There's lots of these. Uh, it's, there's always a mad scramble for them whenever any <laughs> entomology course rolls around. Um, but yeah, oh, fun fact about cockroaches is that, um, so we used to think cockroaches and termites were like two separate um, distinct groups from each other, but it turns mm -hmm. out that termites are actually highly derived social cockroaches. So that's really interesting, even though they're quite different from each other. Um, but yeah, enough of that side tangent. So yeah, this is just another thing that you can just go out and find commonly, well, hopefully not within your house, but um, within like uh, public buildings and whatnot. But the method for pinning these is also really quite simple, very similar to um, beetles. You're also going to want to pin this generally through the um, right wing of the cockroach. Mm. And so, yeah, the wings on cockroaches are slightly different from that of maybe say like a dragonfly which are all like equally membranous but the front wings on these are kind of almost an intermediate between like a, a dragonfly and a beetle in that they're um slightly hardened to form these things called tegmina but this is essentially um it is now suspended on the pin so Very cool. yeah once you freeze them they can't hurt you so just go ahead and do it <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, insects yeah. are highly accessible no matter where you go. They're everywhere, so. Amazing. Sometimes, sometimes you may derive a sense of sick satisfaction out of pinning a, uh, <laughs> a or something like that. So yeah, take that's that true. <laughs> Ainsley, do you have any, um, we're getting to the end of our event here, but I'm wondering if you have any sort of last words of advice for people who are, you know, watching this today, have a, are really excited about insect pinning and might just not know where to start. You've given us some great tips so far, but is there anything else you want to suggest for people? Um, yeah, well, like I said, um, not only reach out to your local natural history museum, because they'll probably have specimens that they would love to either have your help with, or they may have demonstration specimens, like the ones that I'm pinning now that were donated without data that you can you may be able to use. Um, if you're an artist, we often have artists come in and work with our stuff. We, we have people from both inside and out, outside the museum who contact us and say, you know, I need a reference specimen to look at, to borrow, to use. Um, I have an entire drawer of just damaged Lepidoptera and I'm waiting for someone who makes art out of butterfly wings to come talk to me so that we can give it to them and they can make something out of it. It's a great plug. Um, there's also your, if you live in an area with a land grant university, they usually have an extension program, a cooperative extension. And those are the people who are mostly there to help gardeners and farmers and so on, but they also are there to help you with questions about insects. And they are, that's their whole job. And they are great to ask too. And they're usually also really excited to talk to you about bugs. Um, and again, there's people like Brittany and me and basically everywhere. Um, Cleveland and Pittsburgh and New York and you know not just San Francisco but you know, Seattle and every every city every state has a every state has a natural history museum in it somewhere and um, we love talking to people about this stuff um, and a lot of us do school outreach appearances and things mm -hmm. like that um, and yeah so there's there's nothing to stop you from starting you don't have to have a personal insect collection you can donate specimens you can volunteer to work with specimens that are being used in research. And um, no matter what you're studying, if you're in college, there's always room for an entomology class. So. Yes, yes, that's very true. Brittany, what about you? What do you suggest for people who are excited about this now and maybe don't know where to start? Yeah, I mean, I was also totally in that position. So like even before I took entomology, I went out, went on the internet, went on YouTube, um, a lot of um, institutional sites will have like really awesome like PDF guides that are just like accessible on Google for totally free. Um, so I taught myself through that. And again, like these um, tools that I have also highly accessible, you can buy them off um, retailers on the internet as well. And you, yeah, again, you don't have to be like a college student or a um, university professor to really do any of this. I, I did this fully of my own volition without knowing anything about insects. Mm -hmm. And yeah, 
everyone's contributions are so valuable as long as you still have that data of like where and when you collected it it can be used for um studies like for their generations ahead of time. So like things like ecology, conservation, um, taxonomy, which is the science of kind of like naming insects and then systematics, like seeing how insects are like related to each other evolutionarily. Like um, if I can quickly pull out this box over here, like this is kind of like the highlight of what a true research collection should look like. So mm -hmm. in this box, you can see yes. that there's like a bunch wow. of bees in there, right? And um, if you look even closer at some of the tags, a lot of them have like QR codes associated with them. Wow. So yeah, it's, collections are, I know they seem very like old and all, honestly kind of a, like a relaxed thing to have, but um, what's really important that we keep in mind about museums is that they are highly dynamic institutions that have to keep up with the highly dynamic world that we live in. So we need to come up with better ways to make them like more accessible to researchers, more accessible to the public, because again, a lot of our specimens are used for teaching new students, the next generation of scientists. So there's so, so, so many uses. I wish I could explain actually what that box is about. But <laughs> yeah, like there's just so many different uses for collections, both for the public, both for furthering academic research that we just need to um, keep furthering and encouraging, like learning about them and learning about like working in them more, so. Amazing. Thank you both so much for taking time out of your days to show us a little bit about some of the insects that you love and how we can sort of be involved with preserving them for future generations. So um, again, so if you want to follow either Ainsley or Brittany on Twitter, you can find Brittany Hahn at Ento Enthusiast, and you can find Ainsley at American Beetles. Um, you can also follow Science Friday on all of the things we're usually at Sci Fry. Um, and hopefully we will see you all, you know, at your radios this Friday, 2 to 4 p.m. But you can sign up for our newsletter to find out more about some of our upcoming events. Brittany, Ainsley, thank you so much for doing this. Thank you for inspiring love for insects and for collecting for our audiences. Um, and everyone, thank you for joining us today. We'll see you all again very soon, we hope. Bye, everyone. Thank Have a lovely you. day.